Hello, Sublation Media viewers, listeners, and future readers. It's me again, Douglas Lane, and in this video, I'll be returning to my summation of the 1967 book, Society of the Spectacle, by Guy Debord. I'll continue to read the book backward in order to get some distance from the text and to provide you, the viewers, with a summary of a book that has been credited with laying the groundwork for the May 68 student workers' strikes and riots in France with creating the Sex Pistols, and that helped to inspire Adbusters magazine and the call to Occupy Wall Street. In this video, I'll consider how living by capitalist production alters our sense of time, and how what DeBoard called the spectacle hides linear historical developments under a layer of pseudo-cyclical time. I'll explain why it is that we experience even world historic events through a haze of nostalgia why it feels like we're stuck in a rerun, even as everything is changing. The sixth chapter of DeBoard's book is entitled Spectacular Time, and as we work our way backward through the book, we can see that DeBoard is listing all the ways our current society blocks off freedom. He's spelling out how life is unlivable on every level. That is, we are psychologically frozen in a near catatonic narcissism, our attempts to express meaning through art and culture turn against us as we produce financialized abstractions, and our ability to create the space we need in order to organize together, the space for solidarity and unity, has been stripped away. In this chapter, DeBoer explains how the time in which we live, time in which we live our lives, has also been transformed and neutralized. According to the board, everything that happens appears to have already happened, and instead of creating a continuity of change, we are instead merely consuming reruns. Our lives are something we view and consider the way we might consider a long dead culture in a museum. We view our lives, perhaps experiencing some titillation during a few moments, but we never arrive at any real comprehension. Our time comes to us in pre-digested ways, as if the documentaries about tomorrow's scandal, about tomorrow's wars, have already been filmed. For example, as you read in the title of this video, it is yet to be decided if the invasion of Ukraine is even taking place. That title is of course a kind of joke and is itself a rerun. In 1991, the French political philosopher Jean Baudillard published three essays about the armed campaign against Iraq after Iraq invaded Kuwait. The Gulf War Will Not Take Place was published in January. The Gulf War Is Not Really Taking Place was published in February. And The Gulf War Did Not Take Place was published in March. In these essays, Boyard argued that the Gulf War was not really a war, but was an atrocity that was packaged and sold to the West as a mere image. The Gulf War for US citizens wasn't something they were involved in as active participants fighting for their nation, nor even as co-conspirators implicated in a crime, but rather it was something ephemeral, a mere image that they could consume by watching it on television. De Boer makes a similar argument to Boudiard. In this chapter on Spectacular Time, he writes, the pseudo events that vie for attention and spectacular dramatizations have not been lived by those who are informed about them, and in any case, they are soon forgotten due to their increasingly frenetic replacement at every pulsation of the spectacular machinery. Those that are informed about pseudo-events are, according to DeBoer, proletarianized. In the early chapters of Society of the Spectacle, the chapters that are perversely yet to come in this summation, DeBoer claims that the whole world is proletarianized, or at least undergoing a process of proletarianization. Say you're getting tired of lettuce and tomato hamburgers in this town that don't quite make it. To understand the combination of claims, first, that most everyone is now proletarianized, and second, that history and events appear to us as dramatizations that we don't live, but merely observe, 
we should remember that the proletariat is defined not by its activities in factories and workplaces, or not only by that, but also by its lack of property. The proletariat is robbed not only of money and commodities, but also of meaning and control. Today, we are facing a potential world historic event, but only from a distance. For U.S. citizens, we are asked our opinion on whether or not to risk World War III and possible nuclear Armageddon in the same way that we might be asked our opinion about a movie trailer or a new sandwich at McDonald's. There is constant chatter about a return to the Cold War, and those of us who are old enough to remember the 20th century can even feel nostalgic as infographics about nuclear warheads fill our television screens. The end of the world, if it comes, will be a rerun. We are not only asked to sit passively by and watch shots of military convoys and elite negotiation, but in fact have no other option or at least no immediate way to intervene ourselves except as active participants in our own alienation. One choice we do have open to us is to abandon all hope for immediacy and instead reconsider how it is we've become trapped in this repetition. Just why is it that capitalism progresses while we, its subjects, are mired in what seems like an eternal present? Why does the world appear to us as if behind glass, as if it is on display? From a Marxist perspective, the reason can't be the one de Boer gives us. De Boer writes, the time of production, commodified time, is an infinite accumulation of equivalent intervals. It is irreversible time made abstract, in which each segment need only demonstrate by the clock its purely quantitative equality with all the others. It has no reality apart from its exchangeability. Under the social reign of commodified time, time is everything, man is nothing. He is at most the carcass of time. This devalued time is a complete opposite of time as terrain of human development. While it's true that capitalists and capitalism are indifferent to the needs of human beings, it is not the case that what is produced in factories and workshops under capitalism can be reduced to the abstract value that sets up exchanges in the market. A guitar, a bicycle, a book have a reality apart from the reality of the value these commodities represent, a value that really is exchangeable. Further, while the social reign of commodified time does exist precisely where de Boer says it does, in vacation spots and amusement parks, television programs, tour buses, and in a million other purchasable leisure activities, it is not true that the time spent working in the factory is commodified. If this were true, then the purchase of that time could not generate profit. It is not the worker's actual time that is commodified, but his promise to work. The worker does not exchange his time for a wage that is equivalent to the time spent working, but rather the wage is only equivalent to the various commodities necessary for the worker to eat and sleep and be merry enough to return to work the next morning. De Boer goes on to say that pseudo-cyclical time is in fact merely a consumable disguise of the production system's commodified time. But the time itself is not commodified under capitalism. Rather, it is the freedom of the workers that is commodified as a contractual agreement to work for a given length of time. The fact that so many different consumable goods are created in such a variable number of hours demonstrates that, apart from the market, the real work we deploy for our masters is not equal. Further, there is a difference between a vacation in Paris and a trip to Margaritaville. Ultimately, despite the success capitalism has had in capturing and then mediating most of the useful work performed in the world, that work and its sensuous output cannot be reduced to the production of images. Material reality includes our own activity, and the material reality of commodity culture or the spectacle will only persist for as long as we materially reproduce it. Again, the title of the video essay is The Invasion of Ukraine is Not Taking Place, only with a question mark. Obviously, the answer is that the invasion is taking place, but whether it will occur as something other than a repetition 
to something other than another atrocity that in the future will be memorialized with a museum and a gift shop is a question that can't be answered immediately. One thing we can take heart in, however, is that despite all the television shows and tourist packages, despite all the ways we are made to believe that life has already happened and we are to consume its corpse, the reality remains. This is a world we are creating and recreating, producing and reproducing. It may appear to us as an immense accumulation of images and spectacles, but it is also a pile of useful stuff that if we were to take hold of it, we could use to our advantage. If you enjoy these videos, you should click on the subscribe button and click that bell. You should also consider supporting me on Patreon. Patrons get access to a second behind the scenes parrot room discussion where we dish out gossip or go into the weeds on topics such as the tendency of the rate of profit to decline, imperialism, and the critical theories of Tiffany Percet and Donald Most. You'll also get access to both the public and private version of the revised Pop the Left series with Ashley Frawley and Pascal Robert, and the new Zoomer Philosophy series. Your support will not only make content like this possible, it will also help to establish a new publishing venture through Diet Soap Media. Right now, supporting me on Patreon will make a big difference.